Thank you guys so much for leading us, Clay and Nathan, Manny and Mariana. We appreciate you guys. You know, this is a great season. It's a time that we can reflect on the birth of Jesus Christ. It's a time that we can be together with family. It's a time that we can think about the future and what it holds for us. And so we're glad that you guys took time to be here at Anchor Church today. You know, we say this regularly, uh, but it's just our way of continuing to communicate to you things that we value. We're glad that guests come and we're glad that you guys invite people. You guys are the arm and you're the extension of the invites here at Anchor Church. And so I, I'm very grateful for that. Uh, I was talking with a friend and he said, you know, I saw your dad in action. Yeah, he was at the uh, place where I work and he's talking to people, meeting everybody. He's like, man, your dad's got like a whole spiel ready to go, inviting people with a whole line. And I was like, well, he is in sales. So, you know, he's a good, a good man. So, you know, think about ways that you can get out there in the community, invite folks that you guys can invite people because you never know, it might change their life and their eternity. And if you're one of those guests here, we want to say thank you for coming. Uh, we We've got a little info card we'd love for you to fill out. Put your name, phone number, email, credit card information, social security, uh, if you have a Target gift card or not on there. Uh, uh, hopefully you guys didn't get affected by that Target deal. That's tough. No, we, we protect your information. We're just looking for simple info. Just name and phone number and maybe an email. We blast out an email about maybe once or twice a month, our way to stay connected to you. And if you do that and drop it off in the offering box as your gift to us on the way out today, uh, we will give you a $5 gift card to Starbucks or a Bible. We've got lots of Bibles out there. If you don't have a Bible, the Bibles that I teach from are, are right there on the table, so you guys can take one of those on your way out as well. Uh, also, if you're looking to maybe jump in next year, 2014, you're already thinking about New Year's resolutions. Like, how can I serve God more? How can I do more at Anchor Church? Well, there's a lot right here. There's about 17 ways you can serve God here at Anchor Church. And so we even have an other, I think, on here maybe. So you can even make up your own or you just create your own. Yeah, I, I would like to lay salt on the ground when it gets snowy. So that could be a ministry for you. But we would love for you guys to fill that out and step in and, uh, you know, help out. I, I found that for me, the greatest enjoyment I get is exercising the gift that God has given me. And so each of you have a gift given to you by God. You can use it for his glory. And if you're trying to figure out what that gift is, uh, we can help you figure that out together. So, hey, let's pray together. Jesus, we come to you, Lord, and today's a great day. Uh, a day where we can come and adore you. Lord, where we can come before you, get to know you more, Lord, hear from your word. God, this truly, to me, is the greatest story ever told. And Lord, it's my prayer that you would speak through me. God, that you would take this message that we might be familiar with, Lord, and you would add to it. Lord, you would add the, the presence and power of your Holy Spirit. The, the same power that inspired these words to be penned Many years ago by Luke, Lord, I pray that you would breathe that freshness into your word right now for us. God, the power of the word is already there. We really need the, the, the freshness to be breathed into our hearts and our ears and our minds, Lord, as we hear from you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I read a story about a pastor in San Francisco. He had a nice community church nestled away in a neighborhood. And one day he was getting ready for Christmas Eve service and he noticed that there was some activity going on at the front of the altar. There was a little boy, he came up, and he was observing the manger scene at the altar. And the boy went home and celebrated Christmas. And he came back to that church later in the week with his red wagon. And the pastor looked, and there was something missing. It was the baby Jesus in the manger scene. So he went to the little boy, and he said, Young man, have you seen? Je oh, there he is. What are you doing with baby Jesus in your red wagon? And he said, well, I prayed to Jesus. And I said, Jesus, if you give me a red wagon for Christmas, I'll take you for a ride. <laughs> and so sure enough, there he is taking Jesus for a ride. What's the best gift that you've ever gotten at Christmas? Is there something that you were asking for that you even asked God for this gift. Maybe it's your health or a boost in your finances or you want that flat screen TV for all the ball games coming up. I remember one special Christmas to me. My brother and I were young and we loved opening gifts. And we got to that stage where Santa had lost a little bit of his mystery to us and it became more about consumerism for us. We were focused not so much on the birth of Jesus as we were our big gift. 
I don't know if you get a big gift when you celebrate Christmas. We got lots of little gifts. You know, little gifts, socks and underwear, things that you need. Well, those aren't the things we wanted. We wanted the big gift. And my brother opened up his big gift. And he opened up a video game console. And I was thinking, oh, man, I'm getting a big gift. My brother just got a video game console. This is going to be killer. And my gift was the biggest under the tree. It was the largest. It was gigantic. Two by two. And the wrapping paper. There was enough in the whole world to wrap my gift. And it came time for the eldest son to take his rightful place as opening the last gift in the family. And I ripped it apart. And I see this box. Now, many months before, I was watching an infomercial. And the infomercials work on me. I don't know if they work on you or not. But when I was a little kid, you know what I wanted? I was like eight years old. I wanted a Bowflex. I wanted a Bowflex. I thought, I got to get a Bowflex. And my dad's like, that's too big, okay? That's like a $900 gift, okay? And this was back in the 90s when $900 was worth like a million dollars. And I saw a certain infomercial, and I opened up the gift, and I recognized the box. Oh, it was the same thing I saw on the infomercial. It was an ab roller box. <laughs> I looked at my parents, and I kind of smiled. I got a little trick on me. They put my big gift in an ab roller box. <laughs> I, mean, I was about 115 pounds. Okay, I saw this infomercial, and I thought to myself, at the moment, I needed an ab roller. Why? To get all the girls, right? Yeah. That's what those infomercials tell you. You buy the ad roller, you use the ad roller, you get a girlfriend. And as an impressionable child, I thought that was the course. And so I was really excited about it several months ago. But as I'm opening up my gift, I'm thinking, I I'm not like ripped, but I don't need to do sit-ups. And I, I look at my parents and say, is this my big gift? Is this my big gift right here? And I open it up, and sure enough, there's an ad roller in the box. And I said, Jared, don't you remember? You were so happy. You saw this infomercial and you wanted that. And you even said, I want that for my big gift for Christmas. I thought, oh no, that's my big gift. That's what I literally said out loud at Christmas. I was pretty ungrateful for the big gift. It was an unexpected big gift. I had parents who were nice enough to let me take that big gift back and get what I wanted that weekend. But I don't know if you've ever had an unexpected gift like that before. I can imagine that Israel felt that way when the birth of their Messiah was about to occur in a manger. The story unfolds in Luke chapter 2 about Jesus coming into this world and the King of Kings stepping into the world could have come down with all great and might. He could have come down in a chariot. He could have come down with legions of angels at his side with their swords bearing ready to take control of the world. But he came in a very unexpected way. If you have your Bibles, let's look at it, that together. Luke chapter 2 verse 1 says this. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quinarius was the governor of Syria. And all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of King David, that is, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. So Joseph and Mary, they embark on this journey. They take the many miles hike from Nazareth all the way up to Bethlehem to fulfill the prophecy of Jesus, born of the lineage of King David, to go from his region of Nazareth all the way up to Bethlehem to be born in the very city that the King of Kings needed to be born in based on prophecy. And verse 6 says, And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. Now, there's a problem that's going to take place. When royalty shows up, usually everybody unfolds the red carpet. I read that Queen Elizabeth II, on her travels to America, arrived with more than a thousand pounds of luggage, two sets of clothes for morning and night, a set of clothes in case there's a funeral to mourn. She also had a hairdresser come with her, along with her many security guards in her entourage. That is a 
royal welcome. That is a royal entrance. But Jesus doesn't get the same kind of treatment here. Verse 7 says, And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. Mary and Joseph had made this long journey and they had nowhere to go, nowhere to stay. Thankfully, one innkeeper finally stepped up and said, you could stay in my barn. It's almost more like a cave. In fact, it was a place where the manger would be so that the animals could feed from it. It was a place where dirty animals rested. It was a place where people who worked with those animals were considered unclean and couldn't participate in temple duties. This was the royal welcome that Jesus was getting. He heard those words, no room in the inn. Max Lucado writes about this and he says, I think we can all relate to Jesus in one way or another. Many times we've been told there's no room for us. Sorry, there's no longer room for you in this position. We're going to have to let you go. I'm sorry, there's no room any longer for you in my heart. I want a divorce. I'm sorry, there's no room for you to hang out here. We've already got enough friends. Over and over, you and I have heard from time to time, there's no room for you. Well, Jesus heard those words, there's no room for you in the end. And when he was born in the life that he lived, he got ridiculed by the Pharisees. They didn't accept him and his teaching. They said that he was a heretic. They said, there's no room for you. We don't have room for you. We don't think you that you're one of those uh, that has come as a prophet to be the Messiah. No, you're not who we think you are. And on the cross, when they nailed him to the tree, he felt that same rejection. There's no room for you. We don't want you here anymore. We're going to take you out. And even today, there are some who hear the invitation of Jesus to forgive their sins, to invite them into eternity, to spend with God. But they reject him saying, sorry, God, there's no room for you just yet in my heart. The story continues in Luke chapter 2, verse 8, and it says, And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God, saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. The shepherds are out in the field, and I've met a shepherd before. I've seen one live and in person. I was spending time in New Zealand and we were driving off the coast where they had black sand. And we come through the hillside and we see this mass wave of sheep just flooding the field and crossing the street. And we are just enjoying our travels with my mother and father-in-law. And we were rolling deep in two RVs just clunking along. And we had no real place to go. So we thought we'd watch these sheep. And there was these dogs they would run behind the sheep. And any time a sheep would get lost or off track, they would nip at them. They would bite at them, snap at them. And the sheep would get back in line. And there was a big tractor out there moving along and back. We had, they had several shepherds out there taking the herd with them. But it was an incredible experience watching all of these guys working together. The shepherds and the dogs and the sheep all in uniform. But these shepherds that we find in Scripture, they didn't operate like, like, like that. They didn't have the luxury of having a tractor. In fact, they were considered good shepherds. 
gentle shepherds. They would walk with their staff and the sheep would follow. Jesus is coming as the king of kings. And scripture says that he is the good shepherd. Those shepherds out in the field, they were kind of an outcast, a pariah. They were those who weren't allowed to come because of their work with unclean animals, that they weren't allowed to come and be a part of temple duties. (laughs) They lived out on their own. They look a whole lot like maybe a homeless person today. They lay their head where their sheep lay in the pen. In fact, they would have gates set up that were open and exposed. And they would have a barrier behind them and they would put the sheep into the pen and they would lay down in front of the gate They were saying to any intruder, you want my sheep? You're going to have to go through me. I'm going to lay my life down for any lions and tigers and bears. Oh my, that might come scare them or come after them. So Jesus, who calls himself the good shepherd, who lays his life down for us, appears to these outcasts, the shepherds in the field, to announce that he is coming. And he says, I'm coming for all. He uses an angel as his mouthpiece. He says, I am coming even for you, shepherd, this outcast that has been pushed aside. What a great way to reveal himself to mankind. That he's not for the religious elite, that he's not for the rich and powerful, that he is for everyone. And the the shepherds freak out. Have you noticed in Scripture, anytime an angel appears, they always say, do not fear. It's, it's their way of saying, I know, I know, L- look at me, I- I'm, I'm pretty awesome right now. Uh, behold, all that is me, but don't freak out. Relax. I've got good intentions. They have to tell them that. They say, behold, it's okay. I'm here. And the shepherds, they respond with this Joy. They see and sense that, that, that the news from the angels is a good joy. It's the Greek word that actually has an attachment to salvation. That when a person gets saved and their sins are washed clean and that the consequences of their past are removed and that they get to spend eternity with God, the overwhelming joy that comes from salvation. The peace that Luke talks about that accompanies Salvation. That's the word joy that we see here. The gladness that is there. That there's a good news that is being brought to these shepherds, these outcasts. Over and over, God is saying, hey, I come for all. And I come bearing good news. And what comes with that good news is peace. I like the old bumper sticker. I really do. No Jesus, no peace. No Jesus. No peace. See, the joy that comes from salvation brings the peace of God. Because you are no longer an enemy of God. You are no longer at war with God. You have peace with God. And he gives you the peace of God. What continues on here in verse 15, it says, And when the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and to see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And when they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger, and when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. You see the response here? They meet Jesus. They experience the joy of salvation. They get the peace of God. And you know what they do? They share it. They spread it. They tell anyone who will listen. Verse 19 said, But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told to them. So why did Jesus come this way? Well, we see that he comes in the most humble places to reveal to the world that he is for everyone. But the Apostle Paul, he gives us his take in a few verses in Galatians chapter 4. He gives us his perspective on why Jesus came as a little baby. 
Galatians chapter 4, verse 4 says this. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those, or to buy back, to say, this is now mine. To redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. You know, Jesus came at the exact right time in history. The population size of the world at this time was much smaller. In fact, in the last 50 years, there's been more people to live on the planet uh, from this time than all of human history before 50 years ago. He came at such a time when the population size was small enough that the word could spread. But it wasn't so small that travel was impossible. Trade had become major between nations. The seas were governed by different nations to travel and begin to allow trade to go back and forth. The Romans had developed their system of the roads. The opportunity for the gospel to spread was so ripe. The fullness of time. It was the perfect time in human history to get the word out to all of the people in the world. And he comes... And Paul writes and says, here's why. I'm going to send Jesus to redeem those who are under the law. See, in the Old Testament, before Jesus had come, died on the cross, and rose again and ascended to heaven, the world was bound to the law. You can think about the Ten Commandments. I should not steal, kill. Think about the other commandments that the Israelites placed upon themselves that we find in Scripture how far you're supposed to walk on the Sabbath, things like that. I mean, we're accustomed to doing that as well. We, we put ourselves under the law. We agree that the law is good. That's why we drive with our driver's license and we pass our driver's test and we say that we're going to follow the law. But you and I don't follow the law. We're lawbreakers almost every day, aren't we? You go one mile over the speed limit and you just broke that law that you agreed upon. We put the law upon ourselves as well. We get married. We say things like, till death do us part. We come together in this union, this covenant before God. But many of us have had marriages just fall apart. Even though we desire to be in there. We've broken that own law that we've put upon ourselves. There's a lot of laws that we follow. God's saying, I'm going to send my son at the right time for those who are under the law. When you break the law, there is a punishment for that law. According to God, he says that that punishment is eternal separation from him. Death physically and death spiritually. Hell. But I'm going to send my son Jesus at the right time to buy back those who are under the law. See, Jesus came. I've often wondered, why didn't he just show up in his 30s? He started his ministry in his 30s. Why didn't he just show up in his 30s? Have you ever wondered that? I mean, God could have. He could have just, boom, lightning bolt, Terminator style, and crush, Jesus is here as a man, ripped, buffed, and ready to go with his ministry. He could have. But Jesus came as a child, was placed under the same requirements of the law, but there was something different about him in his complete humanity and complete divinity. There was nothing a part of him that could or would ever sin. He lived those 33 years on this earth, perfect, blameless. And then he went to the cross as a perfect, blameless sacrifice to take our place on the cross, to take our place where we deserve to die. And he died as that sacrifice. The shepherds at the time when the angel came were more than likely pastoring the sheep that would be brought to be sacrificed in the temple for the Passover. Jesus was coming at the time to say to the world, I am that sacrifice. I'm going to live that perfect life and I'm going to die in your place. But the why rings through. Paul says it's so that we might be adopted 
adopted. I mean, yes, Jesus came to forgive us of our sins. He's our sacrifice. But it doesn't stop there. He came to adopt us into his family. At this time, the Roman world understood adoption. The Israelites, they had another way for taking care of those who did not have parents. But you know what they didn't do back then? Andy Stanley talks about this. He says, they didn't adopt children because toddlers could die. The infant mortality rate was through the roof at this time. Babies usually didn't make it. That's why they had many kids in hopes that a few might survive. And so the Romans, the rich, the powerful, the people of means and influence, they would adopt adults. That's kind of weird, isn't it? Like, hey, I like you. I'd like to adopt you. But it makes sense. Because the rich, the powerful, those who had political aspirations, those who were in charge, those who ran the show, you know what they usually had? Spoiled brat little kids. Right? They looked at their kids and they said, you know what? There's no way I'm leaving all of this to them. There's no way that I am going to leave this to my kids because my kids are idiots. <laughs> and they would adopt someone in to their family. And they'd write them in their will. And they'd give over the name, the title, the business, the money, so that they could run the affairs. The Caesar at the time that Jesus was born, he did it. He wrote his wife into his will as an adopted child. Imagine the kids sitting down with the lawyer, you're reviewing the notes, and oh yeah, you have a sister. It's your mom. <laughs> they would do that because bottom line, if you're hearing this and you're a person of power, means, and wealth, and you can't trust your kids, what I'm telling you is I'm up for adoption. <laughs> they needed that child to pass it on. And so when God, during this time, says to a people group that are the Gentiles, I'm going to adopt you into my family. I'm the King of kings, the Lord of lords. I am God Almighty. I have all the power, all the means, all the wealth in the world. And I want you, a shepherd, an outcast, someone who said, I'm not deserving of that. I can't live up to that. See, you and I are probably a lot like those shepherds. Looking at my track record, the sins that I've committed, the mistakes I make, I, I, I don't feel worthy of the gospel. In fact, I feel like I should deserve punishment. But God says, no, I'm bringing you in to my family. Look at what verse 6 says this. And because you are sons... God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father, so that you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. He's saying, I am going to forgive you of your sins. I am going to take away the consequences that the law demands of you. And you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to be your dad. You're now in my family. You now are an heir to my throne. Everything that I have is now yours. You get to join me in my kingdom. And you get to advance my kingdom here on earth. And you get to experience my kingdom in heaven. He's saying, yes, your sins will be forgiven. But more than that, you're now in my family. I'm your dad. The word Abba here is an Aramaic term. Abba. It's not a band, okay? It is a band. But Abba means daddy here. The Greeks, they didn't have a word for this. So when you read, read the original translation, you see the Aramaic term Abba. You see the Greek term for father. So basically it's saying, I'm your father, father. 
I'm your dad, daddy. I'm your daddy, daddy. I'm not your baby daddy, just your daddy, daddy. And it's literally putting two words that mean similar things. But the Greeks, they understood this biological father. But the Aramaic term here, Abba, it's that dad, daddy. The term you and I cried out to our dad when we would scrape our knee. The term you and I would cry out to our dad when we needed a hug. The term that you and I would use to describe the intimacy that a family can have between a dad and his kids. And God's saying, I'm the perfect dad. Your dad here on earth might fail you, but I am the perfect dad. I'm your daddy. And this is for you. You're going to be forgiven of your sins, and you're going to be in my family. Read about a family who was having some hard times financially. So for this certain Christmas, they decided to write each other gifts, but they couldn't spend any money. So they wrote things out like coupons for Christmas. I'll wash your car. I'll do the laundry. I'll wash the dishes without complaining. Mom and dad, they wrote the biggest and best one of them all. You have a consequence-free coupon. You mess up. We forgive you. You mess up and you won't be grounded. Fine print, limited, one time use only. (laughs) And they said that was the best Christmas that they'd ever had. You know, I'm thinking about that one time use only, the get out of jail free card. I'm thinking, man, I could have used that over and over as a kid. When Jesus says, you're part of my family, and what was under the law, it's now redeemed, forgiven. It's not just a one-time only coupon. It is for multiple use. Not to be abused, but to be appreciated. The same guy, Paul, who wrote these words in Galatians 4, 4 through 7, who says that he's going to buy you back, redeem you, take you out from under the consequences of the law so that you can be a part of the family. He also said in Romans chapter 7, the things I want to do, I don't do. The things I don't want to do, I end up doing. Well, thanks be to God for His grace. But should I keep on sinning so His grace will abound more? He says, by no means. It's the God's grace that should draw you to repentance. It's His forgiveness that should create inside of you a desire to turn from your sin, to not go back down that road. And it's unlimited. God offers it to you and I today. Maybe you're here this morning, a friend invited you. You've seen the signs. You got an invite on Facebook and you made your way here to Anchor Church. And you feel like the shepherd. You feel like an outcast. You're waiting for an angel to say, I got good news. I bring you peace. I bring you comfort. I bring calm to your storm. The things you've said and done when you've felt like a jerk. The mistakes that you've made. The sin you've committed in your life. I want to tell you about this man named Jesus. He is the forgiver of your sins. If you'll give your life to Him. The gospel is simple, but it's beautiful. You ask God to forgive you of your sins. You believe that Jesus is who He says He was. And that God raised Him from the dead. And you commit your life to Him. And He will send you His Holy Spirit to comfort you and calm your storm. He will send you His presence to bring peace to your life. He will forgive you of your sins. And you know what He will do? He'll say, I accept you, that shepherd. You're a part of my family. You've got a new name and you've got a new destiny. Can that be you today? To take that step to trust God, to not care about what anybody else is going to think, 
To not worry about what others are going to say to you. To not worry about getting blasted on Facebook for now becoming a follower of Jesus. To say, I don't care about what's going on in that world or what people might say. I know Jesus because that's what I long to do is give my life to Him. I know Jesus. I know the message of eternal life that He has given me. And that's worth everything. Could that be you today? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you, Lord, and we ask that for those who don't know you, that today could be the day of salvation. That yes, Lord, right now, they would say this prayer. God, I know I'm a sinner. I'm under the law. I've even made my own laws. I'm about to make some laws come New Year's Day about dieting and exercising that I know I'm not going to be able to keep. It seems impossible. I can't be perfect. But I hear about this perfect man, Jesus, who spent his entire life in perfection. And what I hear is that he paid the price for my sins. He came as a baby, lived a perfect life, and died on the cross. I believe that to be true. And I give my life to you right now. I want you to change it. I want you to take over. I want to live for you. I need your peace. I need good news. And I found it in you. And God, for others of us here, Lord... This story is a great reminder to us of why we celebrate Christmas. Of why you came so early as a little baby. You came for us. You redeemed us. You gave us a new name. We're a part of your family now. Let us live like that. Some of us are still dealing with shame, depression. We're still living like the way we did before we gave our lives to you, God. We don't feel worthy of your acceptance. God, your scripture tells us that we're accepted. We've been adopted. We've been chosen by you. Allow us to live as princes and princesses, heirs to the throne, who have been given your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I do want to thank you guys for coming today. If you made a decision for Jesus to follow him, maybe take a step in your life to have a relationship with him, please fill out this card and check mark that box. It says, I want to know more about a relationship with Christ. We want to give you a gift. We want to give you a Bible. And we want to talk to you about what it means to be a follower of Jesus. And maybe you said, you know, I'm a follower now. I want the world to know I'm ready to come out and tell everybody. Well, Scripture tells us that we do that through baptism. It's your way of telling the world you're not ashamed to be a follower of Jesus Christ. Maybe some of you have been here and you have given your life to Christ maybe many years ago. But you've never stepped forward in believer's baptism to show the world about your relationship with Jesus. Today could be the day that you sign up for that. During this Christmas season, what a better gift to give God than the blessing of saying, hey, I'm proud to be a follower and a family member. I want to thank you guys for coming this morning. We don't have to tear anything down. It's a beautiful day. Woo-hoo! But uh, we, we are going to have a practice for the kids play. They're going to do a uh, dress rehearsal here on the stage. So uh, we just need to move some pipe and drape and um, that's it. And don't forget to take those invite cards with you on your way out for Christmas Eve. We'll see you here at 5, probably 15 or so. We'll see what time you guys show up. But the service starts at 530. So thanks for coming to Anchor Church. Guys, have an awesome week. We'll see you later.